The main, most important point about the uh, the pre-war context was, of course, that it was pre-war. Um, there were a whole series of international threats emerged in the 1930s, threats against the Soviet Union, principally Hitler and the Nazis, but not just that. So obviously the Soviets are considering how they, they're going to respond to those threats. And basically they, they devise a threefold strategy of response, or rather Stalin does, because it's very much uh, his strategy. Um, for, so firstly there's uh, building up Soviet defences, so there's a massive programme of rearmament that takes place in the 1930s. And that's a fairly successful strategy insofar as uh, you know, the Soviet Union is very well armed country uh, by the time uh, the Second World War breaks out by the time the Soviet Union itself gets involved in the war. Um, the second part of the strategy is to uh, find some allies, yeah, to establish some alliances with other states. Um, that's not so successful. I mean, there are some successes uh, in, in that respect, but, but ultimately that part of the strategy uh, fails because what happens is in 1939 the Soviet Union tries to... Um, uh, sign a triple alliance with Britain and France directed against uh, Germany uh, but those uh, negotiations fail, the triple alliance negotiations fail and as a consequence of that failure Stalin turns to a deal with Hitler so then you have the, the Nazi Soviet Pact of August 1939. Now Nazi Soviet Pact is quite a successful um, political manoeuvre in some ways, it keeps the Soviets out of the war, there are certain territorial going to put, but ultimately it leaves the Soviet Union isolated uh, internationally, which wasn't the idea at all. I mean, the, the strategy was not to be isolated, it was to have be part of an alliance against Hitler. Okay, and the third part of the strategy was um, cr so crushing any possibility of uh, domestic uh, opposition or, or dissent. So, um, Domestically, in the 1930s, there's, there's a whole series of uh, waves of mass terror hit Soviet society and the Soviet political the political system. And one of their many motivations from Stalin's point of view was to preclude uh, any opposition to uh, his regime in the event of war. Now, to a certain extent, that's a quite successful strategy because one of the most striking features about the Second World War about the Soviet participation war is that there is, you know, despite the huge defeats that the Soviets suffer in the early years, there's no opposition to Stalin. There's no question of any opposition or removal of Stalin. So Stalin's position uh, is domestically is immensely powerful by the time the war comes. The downside of the Great Terror, of course, is that it's very costly uh, because uh, most of the people, a uh, great majority, overwhelming majority of the people who purge aren't enemies at all, Enemy, either enemies of Stalin or enemies of the system. So there's huge costs uh, in, involved in this uh, policy of mass terror and, uh, and domestic repression. Uh, quite successful. Yeah, sure, he could have done a better job. There were, there were things that the Soviet Stalin could have done. Um, which might have led to a more successful outcome. Uh, I think the main problem was that, okay, he played his cards quite well, but w when we get to the war itself, um, a lot of the advantages and gains that have been made as a result of the strategy pursuers were thrown away in the early period of the war. So, for example, there is this massive program of rearmament, um, massive expansion of the Soviet army, but you know most of that, pre-war Soviet army is destroyed by the Germans within in the first few months of the German invasion of, of the Soviet Union. So so a lot of the the gains from the, you know, the strategy, the policy, um, were lost very, very, very quickly. So to that extent, you know, the strategy was a failure um, uh, and, and, and wasn't a success. But on the other hand, ultimately, you know, Stalin, the Soviet Union, survives the war, wins mm. the war, emerges triumphant and, you know, post-war the Soviet Union becomes, you know, one of the two of the world's um, super superpowers. So there, there is a, there is that kind of justification uh, that you you could put forward. So, so one of the the waves of terror that hits Soviet society in the nineteen thirties is the wave of terror that hits the armed forces, and that that begins in. May, June 1937, when a so-called conspiracy 
is uncovered among the higher ranking officers of the uh, of the of the Red Army, a conspiracy to overthrow Stalin and to subvert the Soviet system. So the, 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 these high ranking officers, including the if the, the commander in chief Tchaikovsky and other marshals and generals, are, are are arrested. They're put on trial for treason, and they're executed. And that that event sparks off a wider purge of uh, the armed forces designed to get rid of um, supposed disloyal elements. So about 34,000 um, officers are purged in 1937-1938. Okay, but about a third of those officers were actually reinstated in the armed forces. Um, most of those who were actually purged, like permanently, either executed or in prison were actually political commissars so there were political officers within the armed forces who came under suspicion politically because of their their, their very, very function so the, the the impact of the purge given the size of the red army huge army millions was actually more limited than than most people think but nevertheless it did have an impact it had an impact particularly uh, on the higher echelons of the, of, of, of the Red Army. So, you know, the top leadership, in effect, most of them is, is decapitated. But then again, you can have an argument. There's an argument as to whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. You know, would this leadership of Purge performed better than the leadership that that took its place? Because during the war, the, the Soviet high command, the Soviet generals who stepped into the shoes of those officers who had been purged before the war actually performed quite well, performed brilliantly, uh, in fact. So it's very, very difficult to um, to assess the actual damage of, of, of the uh, the military purge. But I think it's probably fair to say that it certainly didn't, uh, didn't help uh, the Soviet position. Well, you know, the Soviet army, like all the armies, or at least all the big armies of the interwar period, were thinking about the impact of new technology on warfare and on the, the nature and functioning of military um, uh, formation. So, so one of the big themes of the development of the Soviet armed forces uh, in the interwar period, 1920s and 1930s, is, you know, the modernisation of the armed forces in terms of its equipment, its training, its for, its structure uh, and its and, and and its thinking and its and its uh, it, its, doc, it, its doctrine. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, yeah, the Soviets are, you know, are thinking about how to utilize air power, how to utilize tanks, um, how to take advantage of the the speed afforded by motorization, how to utilize the greater firepower. Um, that, that, that's now available uh, you know, to, to modern arms, and actually come up with some quite um, creative solutions um, to the uh, you know, to the challenges posed by the, the new the, the new military technology. So, in many ways, actually, you could argue, in some ways you could argue that the Soviet Army, the Red Army, is the most advanced army in terms of its thinking, at least in uh, the 1920s and 19, 1930s. Stalin's strategic plan after the signature of the, the, the Nazi Soviet Pact had two, two phases. In the first phase, the plan was to uh, have peaceful coexistence with Germany for as long as possible. Um, in the second phase, when the Nazi Soviet Pact begins to disintegrate, and that's, that takes place or begins in the summer of 1940 after the fall of France, um, the plan is to prepare for war, to prepare for war specifically. Uh, with, with Nazi Germany. Um, now, as far as Finland is concerned, uh, the Winter War, okay, so what happens there is that 1939-40, December 1939 through to March 1940, um, the Soviets um, get involved in a war with Finland. Um, and they get involved in a war with Finland for strategic reasons. And the strategic reason is, is that they're worried about their um, defensive position in the Baltic area, particularly their border with Finland, particularly the security of Leningrad. OK, so what they try to do, they try to force the Finns to concede, make various territorial concessions and, and, um, um, and the, Finns to, the Finns to actually align themselves politically uh, 
uh, with the Soviets as part of their strategy of securing their strategic position in the Baltic. But the Finns refused to play ball, and as a result, um, the Soviets uh, seek a military solution. They, they, they attack Finland with the aim of imposing their demands on Finland. And that, that's where you get uh, the Winter War. The Winter War, which turns out to be a much more protect, protracted conflict than the Soviets anticipated. So initially their attack on Finland, uh, the Soviet attack on Finland is not successful and they suffer some quite big um, casualties. Now, eventually the Soviets do, as you would expect, given the, the relative size of the two countries, they do wear the Finns down and they force to, the Finns to... Um, uh, except uh, a peace deal, yeah? And then under the terms of the peace treaty, which is signed in March 1940, basically the Soviets get what they wanted from the Finns in the first place. Now, one of the reasons that the Soviets and the Finns do arrive at a peace treaty quite quickly once the two sides have decided to, to negotiate is because both sides fear that the British and French are going to exploit the situation and get involved in the conflict. And neither the Finns nor the Soviets want that. The Finns don't want their country being turned into a battleground for the British uh, and the French. Because if that happens, if the British and French get involved in Finland, the Germans are going to get involved. Um, and, and the Soviets obviously don't want to uh, get involved in the conflict with Britain, Britain, Britain and France. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, very quickly the Soviets and the Finns arrive at a peace deal. Now, from the Soviet point of view, okay, it, it, it's a costly war, and there were some um, quite bitter lessons learned as a result of the experience of the war. But ultimately, from the Soviet point of view, they won. It was a successful military operation. But having said that, <laughs> um, in the aftermath of the war, the Soviets conduct an internal review, quite a uh, very, very quite a deep, very extensive internal review of what happened during the war, what the lessons of the war was. And the result of that internal review is um, a series of reforms um, uh, of, the, uh, of the armed forces, you know, the training, the structure, preparations for uh, the next war. And those reforms are very, and also in terms of the technology, in terms of orders for new types of tanks and planes, equipment. And those reforms are very, very important in the, uh, in developing the cap capability of the Red Army in advance of the, the German uh, attack on the Soviet Union, which, which comes a year or so later. One of the things that happened uh, after uh, the Soviet Finnish war, and as a result of this in program of re military reforms, which takes place in the spring and summer of 1940, is that a lot of officers who'd been purged before the war, were reinstated into the armed forces. They were, they were rehabilitated and brought back, including some very high-ranking officers. So, for example, one of the, um, one of the most famous Soviet marshals of the Second World War um, was Marshal Rokossovsky. Well, before the Second World War, Rokossovsky was a, a, was a victim of a purge. He was in prison. But in 1940, he's, uh, he's reinstated in the armed forces at... at quite high rank at the level of colonel and then very shortly after that he's promoted to be a general so there's some kind of strange things going on here isn't there you know on the one hand you do have this massive purge before the war and yet in 1940 um here's stalin and the soviets bringing these people back into the, into the ranks yeah The big turning point in the Nazi Soviet Pact is, is the fall of France in June 1940, which kind of well, upsets everyone's um, calculation, not least the French, of course, because you know, the, when the war breaks out in September 1940, there's, there's an expectation that the, the Second World War will be much like the First World War. Mm -hmm. There'll be a prolonged war of attrition on the Western Front between, on the one hand, Britain and France, and on the other hand, uh, Germany. Um, and that's part of Stalin's calculation as well. Stalin's calculation is that you know, the Germans and the British and the French will be fighting each other, so they won't, there'll be less of a danger from the Soviet um, point of view. But uh, the German victory over France, which is a very decisive victory, a uh, relatively cheap victory, well, um, of course, establishes German domination of continental Europe. And Britain, of course, is isolated. OK, it fights on, but it's not really... It doesn't pose any um, real strategic danger as far as Germany uh, is, uh, is, is concerned. OK, so it's the fall of France that's, that 
changes the strategic scenario. And, and so now the strategic scenario is that, that Germany um, dominates continental Europe. The only real rival, competitor, danger, threat to German domination of Europe comes from the Soviet Union. So that, that creates, turns the Soviets from being kind of allies of Germany into uh, being a threat, a strategic threat. And a similar process happens on uh, the Soviet side is that you know, the, uh, you know from summer 1940 the Soviets begin to perceive uh, the Germans as um, you know the future enemy rather than uh, a country they're trying to coexist peacefully with. It, it, it's often said that Stalin was surprised by Operation Barbarossa by the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. And the surprise factor is often said to be one of the major reasons why the Germans are so successful uh, initially uh, and why you know, within six months of uh, the launch of Barbarossa, uh, the Germans are on the verge of victory you know, and the Soviet Union is teetering on the edge of, uh, of military uh, collapse. So that's, that's, that's quite a, a, a common view, Stalin's failure to anticipate um, Barbarossa. I don't agree with that view personally. I, I don't think that Stalin was surprised um, by Barbarossa, by the fact that the Germans um, uh, attacked. I think what surprised Stalin, not just Stalin, but his generals as well, was the nature of the German attack. What the Soviets thought was going to happen, this, this was their kind of military doctrine, they thought that, okay, the Germans would attack, um, but there would be two or three weeks of border battles. Uh, and during this period, both sides would mobilise their, their main forces for strategic operations. And on the Soviet side, what the Soviets anticipated happening was that during this two-week period, they would defend their position successfully, they thought. And in the meantime, they would prepare their um, counter-offences. You know? So um, that, that was the concept. You know, when the Germans attacked, the Soviets would defend, then they would launch a whole series of counter-offences. And there would be time to prepare these counter-offensives. So, but what happened on um, June 22nd, 1941, is the Germans attacked with far greater force and power than the Soviets anticipated. And not only that, Soviet defences crumbled uh, in the face of, uh, of this attack. And when they tried to um, organise these counter-offences they had planned, which they did try to do, um, yeah, they, they, they actually compounded uh, the, uh, the, the problems uh, they were facing. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's the attack that surprises Stalin or his general for that matter. It's the nature of the, the attack, the success of the attack, the failure of Soviet defences and the failure of the Soviet um, uh, counter-offensive counter -offensive plans, yeah. The Germans don't storm through. I mean, they're quite successful, but they pay a heavy price for their su successes. Um, and one of the things that happens is that the Soviets um, suffer these massive casualties. So by the end of 1941, the Red Army has suffered four million casualties. Four million. Virtually the whole of the pre-war Red Army, the army that had been assembled over a decade or more to, to, to fight the war, had been, had been destroyed. Um, so Red Army suffers these huge casualties, but it doesn't collapse. Soviet resistance doesn't, it, it continues. The Soviets continue um, to fight. Um, and indeed, you know, so the Germans get as far as Leningrad and they besiege Leningrad, surround Leningrad, but you know, Leningrad fights on. Uh, the Soviets penetrate um, quite deeply in the south, you know, they, 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 they take the, the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, they get as um, far as Rostov. But again, you know, there's quite huge kind of Soviet resistance and eventually the German attack in the south peters out and indeed uh, the Red Army reverses uh, some of the, um, the German advance. So German troops, for example, are, 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 are thrown out of Rostov. Uh, I think that was in November 1941. And then, of course, you have the, the German advance on Moscow. And what happens there is that, OK, in the summer of 19... You know, in, in sort of 
July, August 1941, or August 41, uh, the Germans changed their um, strategy and policy and they decided to target Moscow as their main strategic goal. So they decided that if they can get to Moscow, take Moscow, then, then effectively they would have won the war. And they were probably right about that as well, had they s succeeded. So that's what they try to do. But what happens is, is that in you know, July, August, well, August, September 1941, there's a whole series of battles um, on the Moscow axis uh, in, in, and around, in, in and around Smolensk. So the German advance on, on Moscow is held up for two months in and around the, the Smolensk uh, area. Um, so that's, that, that, that itself is a kind of gauge of the, the depth of Red Army resistance to the further German parts. Now, eventually, the Germans' advance on Moscow does resume. You know, uh, they do put, they do push forward, but suffering heavy, uh, heavy casualties, uh, and they do get reach the outskirts of Moscow. But by the time they get to that point, um, you know, the, the, they're in quite a weak position themselves. You know, they've got their own problems, mm -hmm. and you know, the Soviets are not done yet. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, the great turning point in the um, the Eastern Front War, the, the Soviet German War, uh, is at Moscow in December 1941, when in front of the Soviet capital, the, the Red Army launches this massive counteroffensive, uh, which pushes the Germans back 100 miles away from, 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 from Moscow. Um, and the Moscow counteroffensive signifies that Operation Barbarossa, Operation Barbarossa, which was an operation to win the war against the Soviet Union in, 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 in just a few months, Operation Barbarossa had failed as a strategic operation. Now, a year later, there's another um, crucial strategic um, turning point, which is at Stalingrad in, um, in, uh, in, 90, in 1942. What happens there is that in 1942, the Germans resume their um, offensive against the Soviet Union. And what they, they attempt to do, they attempt to reach Baku. Um, summer of 1941, the German goal wasn't Stalingrad as such. They wanted to get to Baku, because Baku uh, is where the Soviet oil fields are. So they're trying to strangle the Soviet war economy by grabbing the oil, basically. In order to do that, in order to get to Baku, they need to defend their um, advance in the south. And the way they need to do that, they need to capture Stalingrad to consolidate their defences against uh, a Red Army um, counterattack to stop them advancing. And that, that, and it's out of that you get the uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, end of 40, summer forty two through to early nineteen forty three. Yeah, same thing happens at Stalingrad. The Germans fail to take Stalingrad, and uh, the Soviets prepare a massive counteroffensive uh, operation, uh, uh, which. Uh, uh, turns the tables at Stalingrad, and the German forces in Stalingrad are surrounded uh, by the, the, the Red Army and eventually forced to surrender. With Stalingrad, basically any hope of a German victory on the Eastern Front uh, is gone. Stalingrad is um, the point of no return for the Germans. There's no way back for them strategically, you know, after Stalingrad. Stalingrad on, the Germans are, all, or are, always, uh, are always going to lose the war. Okay, so, so the two great turning points of the Soviet Union War are, firstly, the, the defensive and then the counteroffensive Battle of Moscow in uh, the autumn of 1941, and then the, uh, the Stalingrad battle in 42-43. There was quite a lot of um, collaboration with the Germans in the areas that they uh, they occupied as part of their their invasion of the Soviet Union. So particularly in uh, in Ukraine, uh, for, for, for example, um, not just collaboration, also quite a lot of um, resistance. Quite a lot of the population in in Ukraine and other occupied areas, uh, you know, um, remained loyal, uh, you know, to 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 the Soviet Soviet regime. Um, yeah, the Germans don't play their cards very. Um, very well in the occupied areas. Um, they pursue a, a series of brutal policies. I mean, one of the most, the most brutal, of course, was the mass murder of Soviet Jews. Never forget that. Uh, the Germans murdered a, a, a million Soviet Jews in 1941, 1942, and that was the beginning of the Holocaust. The Holocaust began on the Eastern Front with the murder of a million Jews. Um, 
so that, that, was, that those occupation policies you know, turn uh, you know local populations um, against uh, against the Germans. So so when uh, when the Soviets um, do retake those uh, territories, you know, there's quite a large measure of uh, support. There's no opposition or problems you know behind Soviet lines. There's absolutely no. Although having said that, <laughs> the Soviets uh, think they're are some problems or there might be some problems so one of the other things that happens is that um, a number of ethnic minority groups that are suspected of collaborating with the germans or being potential uh, collaborators with germans that they're they're they're, um, they're they're repressed uh, and large numbers of people are deported to siberia so there is a kind of clearing away of potential enemies uh, that, that takes place throughout the war in fact but there's there's no, there's no real there's, there is no there is no kind of opposition to stalin and his regime and uh, and and the communists now that's partly because of you know, the repressive power of the system. It's not just that; is that you know Stalin and the Soviets um, are able to mobilize the population on a patriotic basis. You know, this, this, the, the war is called the Great Patriotic War, so that's the basis on which uh, the Soviets rally uh, support for the war against um, Germany, and it's quite a successful uh, war. And of course, the the the, the aggression and brutality of the Germans reinforces uh, the, you know, the, that, that, that patriotic, um, uh, you know, uh, mobilization because the Soviet system and Stalin comes to be seen uh, uh, as being the better alternative, even by those who, you know, maybe before the Second World War had been opposed to or, um, or, or, or were very skeptical about the regime. Stalin is very interested in military theory and very uh, military strategy. Uh, an interest which began during the, the the Russian Civil War after the Russian Revolution. Um, during the Civil War, Stalin is like a lot of other Bolshevik leaders. He's sent out into the field to be a, a political commissar and to supervise uh, military op operations. Um, and in that context, uh, Stalin you know, begins to grapple with you know, questions of military strategy, uh, military theory and tactics. Uh, um, and a major, well, major, sorry, a major theme of Stalin's like reading was those kind of books. So in Stalin's personal library, you find works by um, Clausewitz, Moltke, Lundendorf, as well as um, Soviet uh, strategic theorists as well. So yeah, uh, Stalin's you know, quite very well read, very, very well informed. Um, when it, when it comes to military issues, at least at the kind of general and abstract uh, and abstract level, so th that kind of background reading and knowledge kind of equips him, uh, I think, to um, you know, to cope, at least at least to a certain extent to cope with the demands of uh, of, of military of military leadership. Um, the other point to note is uh, there's a very kind of um, uh, deep discussion goes on uh, within the Red Army before the Second World War about strategic concepts. Um, there are some key strategic concepts are developed which later on um, assume quite important practical importance during the war itself. So for example, in 1920s, 1930s, Soviet strategic theorists begin to develop um, concepts of what are called deep battle and deep, deep operations. What this refers to is this. Well, let's just let's take deep battle first. The, the, the concept of deep battle is basically um, that with kind of modern firepower and um, the means of delivery, the speed with which uh, attacks can be delivered, there is the possibility of um, very deep penetration of enemy's defences, yeah? So that, that's where you get the concept of, of, of deep battle. And kind of object of this deep penetration is not necessarily to destroy the enemy or annihilate the enemy, it's to deliver a shock, a blow, a shock. It's kind of, um, deep battle is a kind of early version of shock and awe, yeah? Uh, so th that's the idea, deep strikes to actually shock the enemy, to collapse their capacity to, you know, uh, to resist. Um, and the other thing about deep battle is this, is there's no such thing as a single deep battle. 
the concept is there's going to be a series of linked deep battle strikes across um, a broad front. And that's where you get the concept of deep operations. Deep operations is a series of deep battle, op deep battle strikes. Uh, and operational art is about coordinating, um, uh, coordinating those, those deep battle strikes. So that, that, those are the kind of concepts that have been developed in the 1920s and 1930s. And those concepts are actually in, in incorporated into uh, Soviet uh, military manuals, yeah? In, 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 in their service, uh, service re re regulations. Um, but there are problems uh, with their concepts, or not problems with the concepts, but problems with their practical application, because in practice it's very difficult to organize these deep battle and these deep, 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 deep operations. You um, need very sophisticated logistics, means of communication, you need very high quality um, troops and commanders, officers, to be able to conduct these highly sophisticated operations. So what happens is that in, in practice, it, when they're trying to put them into practice in exercises, um, it's very difficult. So th th they kind of, they fall into a bit of disrepute. They're seen as being, um, okay, at, interesting abstract ideas, but of limited practical utility. The other thing that happens is that the, the people who put forward these ideas, uh, which included Tukhachevsky, who was the, uh, the, the commander in chief who was purged in 1937, well, he was purged and others, others were purged and died. So the proponents of these ar arguments you know, left the scene, uh, so, so to speak. So, so to speak. So, these ideas, which are developed, are uh, falling to, to neglect. And they don't really re-emerge in, in the war itself. In the war, you don't find discussions about deep battle and deep operations in, um, you know, in, in, in Soviet military documents. It's just, just that discourse doesn't exist. But what does persist is certain practical ideas. So what, in, in the war, particularly in the latter stages of the war, the Soviet, the Red Army does actually conduct um, battle and deep operations in the sense that I, 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 de I, de I defined it earlier. So there's a kind of practical, creative development of these deep battle, deep operational ideas. But in terms of the, you know, the theoretical discourse, the abstractions, that, 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 that's absent, which makes it quite, uh, you know, it's very difficult to actually put a handle on these, on, 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 on these, on these concepts. Soviets survive the initial German onslaught and then go on to win the war for you know, a number of reasons. You know, it is to do with population, it's to do with material resources, it's to do with leadership, it's to do with the, the Soviet economy, it's to do with the aid that the Soviets uh, received from, from uh, you know, from its allies. So you know, there's there's a multiple, you know, it's a multi, you know, it's a multiplicity of factors which help um, explain. You know the Soviet victory uh, in 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 the Second World War. Um, from my, the, the, the one that interests me um, most personally uh, is is the personal factor, the the leadership factor. Uh, yeah, and the argument I've developed in my books uh, about Stalin is is the important personal role that Stalin uh, plays during the war. So so my argument is that yeah, Stalin's the the ind indispensable factor. Um, Without Stalin's leadership and the role that he plays, you know, the Soviet war machine, the Red Army, it, it, the system, the resources wouldn't have um, operated as effectively as it did. You know, it did, you know the Soviet regime you know, that wins the Second World War is the regime that Stalin created before the Second World War. It's not going to um, you know, perform well if Stalin doesn't perform well. Now, having said that, having said that, you know, the system performs well um, and Stalin performs well, you know, by well I mean it's, effect, it's, 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 it's effective in the end, you know, they win, but it's not very efficient and it's also a very brutal uh, system, you know, so Stalin is a very brutal um, dictator, uh, um, a very violent uh, you know, leader, you know, it, it's, you know there's, there's a huge price that's paid, uh, you know, by the Soviet people for Stalin's victory in the Second World War.
you know, the Soviet economy performs very uh, very well during the war. I mean, one, you know, one of you know, you know, the Soviets outperform the Germans in a number of spheres, and one of them is in the sphere of of, of material production, of of armaments production. Um, so, Soviet economy is a much much more effective war economy than the German war economy, much more effective than the British war economy, almost as effective as the as the, the American. Uh, war economy. So, so, so this, you know, the economic system delivers the goods that make victory um, possible. Question is, you know, what was that because it was a, a command economy, a planned economy, or was that in spite of it? So, so some people, some people, you know, used the war, uh, you know, you know, to show that um, in, at least in certain circumstances, um, command economies like the Soviet economy. Can, can, can operate very uh, 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 effectively. That's one perspective. Another perspective uh, uh, is that you know, what happens in the war, because it's an emergency situation and because people are behaving differently in this emergency, because there is this patriotic um, mobilisation going on, so it's huge commitment to, 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 to the economy and the part of the population, is that the economy functions in a different way during the war, much more flexible, um, uh, much more creative way. Uh, so it didn't really fun, you know, it, 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 you know, the Soviet economy is a successful war, war economy, the extent um, to which it overcomes its own limitations as a command economy and operates differently during the war. OK, but that, that's an ongoing argument between you know, d different <laughs> perspectives. But in the end, you know, whatever the answer to that question <laughs> is, it, it, it worked. That, yeah. that, that, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely for sure. Now, the other factor in the situation economically was, of course, um, the assistance, the material assistance that the Soviets received from its allies during the war. O yeah, obviously, we're talking about you know, the Soviet-German war here, but you know, the Soviet Union was pl part of a grand alliance against Nazi Germany, a grand alliance with, with Britain, the United States, and many other countries as well. Um, and within the context of uh, the Grand Alliance, you know, the, the Soviet Union receives massive uh, military uh, material material aid from the United States, from Canada, from Britain, from Australia, from a whole number uh, of countries. Um, and you know, this aid this aid is very important to the Soviet, Soviet victory. About ten percent of all Soviet wartime economic needs um, came from this uh, from from Allied aid, uh, which is huge kind of chunk of aid, you know, some hundreds of thousands of um, trucks, Studebaker trucks, uh, were supplied by the Americans. Um, about a third of the Soviet population was fed uh, by the Allies without food supplies. There would have you know, been, probably been mass starvation in the Soviet Union or in parts of the Soviet Union uh, during the war. So, so this aid is, is, is massively important to Soviet victory. But the, the, the aid itself doesn't start coming through in large quantities until after the Battle of Stalingrad. So the, 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 the outside assistance is, is important for the Soviet strategic offensive of from 43 through to 45. So it's important to securing the victory, to winning the war uh, at a much uh, more, more, more quickly more effectively and a much cheaper cost but yeah it, it's not so important in um helping the system to survive in the early years of the war although having said that you know there was some aid coming through right from the early months of the war and given that the whole situation was on, 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 on such a knife edge any aid any support um w was important and certainly the soviets uh, valued uh, that support and said so at the time. The other point I make about you know the Grand Alliance and its importance as far as the the Soviet war effort is concerned, and this is particularly important during the first couple of years or so when the Germans are winning and when you know it's it's not clear what the outcome has been, and that's um, the psychological impact of the Soviet Union having allies wasn't isolated. Um, this is very important for, for civilian, you know, for morale, not just civilian morale, but for military morale uh, as well. Um, big theme of um, Soviet propaganda throughout the war was that, you know, we're not fighting that this war on our own. We are fighting this war together with, with, with our allies. And I think that the psychological support of the Soviet Union's uh, Western allies in the early it was very, very, very important. It may well have been. Uh, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of a decisive, a decisive factor.
The reason the the, the Britain, the United States, other countries uh, pour so much uh, aid into the Soviet Union during the war is that that's because where most of the fighting is taking place. You know, you know, it's the Red Army that's winning the war for the the Grand Alliance. Um, but if you total up all of the combat that takes place in the Second World War, about 80% of it takes place on the, the Soviet German front. Um, 90% of German losses uh, occur on the East Front. 90% of all German casualties, dead, missing, wounded, occur on the East Front. What does that mean in terms of figures? Well, 10 million is what it means. 3 million dead, 7 million wounded and missing. Um, so I mean, it's on the Eastern Front that, you know, <laughs> The Germans uh, you know, lose the war. The Soviets, and it's not just the Germans as well. It's, the Germans have their allies as well, remember. You know, the, the Romania, hu um, Hungary, um, S uh, Slovakia, Croatia, Finland. Talking earlier about the, the Winter War. Or the, when, when the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in June 1941, the Finns join in that attack. And, and that they besiege uh, Leningrad uh, from, uh, from, from, from the north. Um, so there's lots of... Italy as well, Spain, Spain spends it. So it's a lot of, it's not just German divisions that uh, the Red Army has to deal with, it's it's many other country divisions as well. So during the war, the, the Red Army destroys 600 enemy divisions, if you, if, you, if you imagine. Okay, so the statistics tell their own story. You know, the Second World War was fought primarily uh, on the Eastern Front, and, you know, the war was won and lost on the Eastern Front. It's as simple as that, I think. Okay, within the Soviet high command during the war, there, there's a debate between some generals who, who um, argue in favour of encirclement manoeuvres and other generals who favour broad front uh, advances. So there are some, some generals, for example, like uh, Zhukov, Stalin's deputy spring commander, who want to conduct battles of encirclement. That's to say, enemy... I'm talking about quite large-scale encirclement battles, it's not, not tactical encirclements, uh, where en enemy forces are, 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 are encircled and then trapped within the, the encirclement and then, then they're, they're, um, they're crushed. Which is kind of what the Germans had done to the Soviets, by the way, in 1941, um, during Operation Barbarossa. Uh, large yeah, Soviet casualties in the early period of the war were due to successful German encirclement uh, manoeuvres, which trapped hundreds of thousands of Soviet uh, troops and uh, who were then, you know, uh, uh, you know forced, to, forced to surrender. So, in a way, you know, some of so so Stalin's generals want to actually do to the Germans uh, what the Germans had done to them in 19, 19, 19, 1941. But the problem with encirclement manoeuvres is that they don't always work or they didn't and they didn't always work because um, they're very difficult to to conduct. Uh, the enemy can escape, that, you know, and that happened quite often. You know, they, they were supposedly encircled, but there was a way out. They uh, you know, uh, they, they were able to escape, and they can be very costly to actually liquidate the enemy forces uh, you know, within the encirclement. So, so in practice, there was a lot of question marks over the encirclements. So, for example, the most famous um, encirclement manoeuvre of the Red Army during the Second World War was, of course, the battle, at the Battle of Stalingrad, when the German forces in Stalingrad are encirculated, they're enveloped by um, actually uh, a, a, a free-pronged um, so Soviet attack. So quite a successful um, operation. Problem was that after they conducted this manoeuvre, um, they, they found that they trapped a lot more Germans inside Stalingrad than they thought they had, which meant that it, 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 was a, it took them a lot longer <laughs> and much more costly to actually reduce the encirclement and to force the Germans to surrender. The other problem um, with the Stalingrad encirclement manoeuvre was this, was that the Soviet aim was twofold. Firstly, they wanted to encircle the Germans in Stalingrad, but they also wanted to cut off German forces in south of Stalingrad who were heading towards Baku. They wanted to trap the Germans in the south. But because the encirclement manoeuvre proved to be more, more difficult and more costly and more demanding, the Germans in the south were able to, to escape from, 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 uh, from being cut off. Also, at the same time as um, 
uh, the Stalingrad uh, counteroffensive is in launch. There's a sim- there's a there's a parallel counteroffensive um, in front of of, uh, of Moscow. The um, Stalingrad encirclement movement was called Operation uh, Uranus. Yes, the one in front of Moscow was called Operation Mars. So the one in front of Moscow was designed to encircle a good chunk of Army Group Center. Problem was Operation Mars failed. You know, so that, that was a failed. Uh, in, in certain circle movement. So th- th- there was a lot of scepticism um, about uh, encirclement operations, uh, and Stalin shared that uh, encirclement. Stalin tended to favour broad front uh, advances, uh, you know, capturing territory and holding on to and, and holding and holding on to that territory. And in broad terms, that was the stra- mostly that was the strategy of the Red Army during the Second World War. It was broad front advances rather than um, encirclement manoeuvres. I think it came, it came it came very close, quite close. I think it was it was on the knife edge. Um, the tide, you know, the war could have swung either way. I, I, I don't think German defeat was inevitable, nor was Soviet victory uh, inevitable. I, until you have the the decisive encounter at Stalingrad, you know, the Germans can win and the Soviets, uh, you know, can lose. So I think it was it was a close, a, uh, you know, a close run thing. I think what made the difference was leadership. Yeah, um, I, yep. in, in terms of the the, the, the failure of, of Operation Barbarossa in um, at the end of 1941, um, Bar- Barbarossa fails because of the failure of the Germans to you know to take Moscow, and because the, the Red Army launches a very successful counteroffensive uh, in front of Moscow. Well, crucial turning point uh, in. You know, the Battle of Moscow comes uh, in November, early, 7th of November, 7th and 8th of November, 1941, when Stalin makes a very big decision to remain in Moscow, not to personally leave Moscow, and to continue with the traditional kind of parade and speeches on the anniversary of the Russian uh, of, 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 of the Russian Revolution. And, and Stalin's actions at that moment are very, very important turning point, psychological turning point in terms of stabilising uh, the Soviet um, defence of Moscow and boosting morale in advance of the coming of the coming coming counter effects. So, you know, so, so Stalin personally, I think, and this will be generally recognised, you know, um, played a very important personal role in saving Moscow uh, in uh, in, 19, uh, in, in 1941. And then, you know, similarly, you know, the other big turning point comes at Stalingrad uh, a year later. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's decisions um, that are taken that make the difference here. And this time it's not just Stalin, it's Stalin and his generals. And Stalin and his generals holding their nerve uh, in um, the face of the, the, the German advance in the south and the uh, the battle that's going on in Stalingrad and um, taking the right decisions to actually to, to wage a war of attrition within Stalingrad uh, with the Germans, but at the same time preparing their counterbow, pre- preparing this famous counteroffensive, this encirclement of the German forces um, in uh, within Stalingrad. And so, you know, again, it comes down to a question of leadership. In this case, uh, a combination of Stalin's leadership and that uh, of his generals. Um, you could broaden that into a more sort of general point. You know, what's the difference uh, between the Germans and the Soviets? Well, Stalin is a better warlord than Hitler is, and the Soviet high command, the combination of Stalin as warlord and his generals, is much, much more effective um, leadership group than 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 their German counterparts, uh, you know, the, 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 than Hitler and his uh, and, and his generals. Question: I was just reading a book about um, Frederick the Great just recently, and uh, who of course is another great military leader historically, and 
uh, the author of this particular book, he said about Frederick the Great was that Frederick the Great was a great warlord, but he was, wasn't that good a general. And I think you can say the same about Stalin. He was a good warlord. He was a great warlord, but he wasn't that great a general. But then he didn't need to be um, a great general because he, he was surrounded by <laughs> some very good very good people, some very good generals. And Stalin's um, genius, if you like, in the war, this situation, was making effective use of this very, very talented high command that he, 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 uh, uh, he had at his, uh, at, his, at his disposal. And Soviet General's own verdict on Stalin is, is, very, is, is very similar to what I've just said, is that Stalin was a, a, a very good uh, war, war leader, warlord, um, and he wasn't a bad strategist and he wasn't a bad general, but they'll say, well, he didn't need to be that good because that was our job. You know, we were the professionals and he allowed us um, to do our job. And, and actually, sometimes Stalin was right and, 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 they, were, and they were wrong. The, the Soviet German War was a war of attrition, um, but it only becomes a war of attrition when, with the failure of Operation Barbarossa, and only continues to be a war of attrition uh, with the failure of the German advance in the south, with the with the German defeat at uh, at Stalingrad, um, and. and as a war of attrition, it's a war that the Germans are always going to lose because they're faced with superior resources and provided their opponents can effectively utilise their resources, they're always going to lose war. Because not, not just talking about Soviet resources, talking about the resources of, of, of Great Britain and, of course, most importantly, the United States. The Germans are always going to, to lose a war of attrition. On the, on, on, on the Eastern Front, and, and they know that, which is why Operation Barbarossa is designed to win a, a very quick war in order to avoid get, getting into a prolonged uh, attrition struggle uh, with the Soviets, and the Stalingrad manoeuvre uh, is, uh, is the same. So what happens is, is that the German strategy of trying to avoid um, a war of attrition fails. But why does it fail? It, it fails because of the success of the Soviets. Uh, in, in defending uh, their their their, uh, their position in 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 in, in their will their their, will, their resistance continuing you know, they, you know the Germans never ever uh, broke uh, the Soviet capacity to wage war or even came close to it and and that and, and that that's the, that's what made the difference.